So, some of the actions that uh, we perform on an everyday basis are done in response to stimuli. So there's, there are plenty of examples like the phone rings and you answer it, or the uh, traffic light turns yellow and you press on the brakes, or maybe you press on the gas. Uh, but I think just as many, if not uh, more, of our actions uh, that we perform on a day-to-day -day basis are not done in response to a stimulus, but they're, they're uh, triggered endogenously. So that would include like picking up the phone to call your mother and say hi, or uh, doing some research, uh, or vandalizing a road uh, traffic camera. And, uh, that's, I think that's especially an act of, uh, of free will <laughs> that I have a lot of respect for. <laughs> So, and, and a key theme in, in, in my talk will be theme not just about self what we call self-initiated actions, but about the precise time of onset of the self-initiated action. So I'll give you just a simple example. You're drinking uh, your morning cup of coffee and reading the newspaper, and at a given moment you reach for your cup of coffee to take the next sip. The question is, why did you initiate that reaching moment, uh, that reaching movement, precisely when you did, and not say 200 milliseconds earlier or later? Right? That may seem like a, a, a nit, but you'll see it will become important later in terms of explaining where the readiness potential comes from, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so the first to study this sort of thing, the first to study self-initiated movement, in, in my mind, is it was uh, Kornhuber and Deka with their uh, discovery of the readiness potential, which I think needs no introduction in this, in this room. Is there anybody who doesn't know what the readiness potential is? <laughs> no, okay, I don't think so. Um, it has since been uh, observed at the single unit level as an increase in firing rate in individual neurons in, uh, in the uh, uh, pre-SMA of uh, epilepsy patients, implanted patients. And it's also been documented in primates, rodents, and even crayfish an invertebrate has a readiness potential, which they call a readiness discharge. Um, about 20 years after Cornhuber uh, and Deka's discovery, we have the work of Benjamin Libet, uh, equally if not more famous. And I think this also needs no introduction in this room. Uh, this was Libet's work arguing that the uh, initiation or the, dis the, the initiation of the action in the brain happens long before we're consciously aware of our own uh, urge or decision to initiate the action. Um, so these, these two studies uh, and, and many others uh, that have followed them have led to what I caricature here as, as the prevailing view. Um, so somewhere quite far back in time uh, is a decision, um, presumably at the point where the readiness potential, where the onset of the readiness potential is, if, if you can find an onset with this, uh, with this study. Uh, and the rest is an outcome, uh, or what's called planning and preparation for movement. This is what people refer to most often. Uh, and, and then, of course, somewhere late in the game is when the self becomes conscious of, of the decision to move. I'll talk. I, I won't speak as much about that uh, today. But I think what's surprising is that more than 50 years after the discovery of the readiness potential, we still lack precise mechanistic account of what this thing means beyond uh, catchphrases like planning and preparation for movement. Um, so I'd like to offer uh, a new perspective, a new interpretation of what the readiness potential is. Now some of you in this crowd have already seen this thought experiment, uh, but for the benefit of probably the, the majority who haven't, I think it's worth doing. This is sort of a, it's a thought experiment, it's what Dan Dennett would call an intuition pump. So it's not a, it's not a perfect metaphor, but hopefully it gets the intuition across. Um, so the idea here is that it's flu season and you want to study the etiology of the flu, you're interested in what happens in the days and hours leading up to the onset of flu symptoms. So you take a cohort of, of people at the beginning of flu season and you outfit them with one of these bracelets that's measuring their uh, vital signs at, uh, once per minute all throughout the uh, flu season saving that data. So it's giving, it's reducing it all to say one number, which is sort of like your health points in a video. Right? Uh, and then if the volunteer gets sick with the flu, they press a little button 
on the bracelet, and that, that marks the time that they fill. So I, I, I'm aware now that I'm sick of the flu. Um, so these are just some example uh, traces, data from, from a few of the subjects, and I'll just point out a couple of obvious points about these. Um, one is that, well, you can see that they're relatively uh, healthy, and then it, where the arrows are, this is where they came down with the flu, so their health drops, stays down for a while, and then comes back up. But one thing you'll notice, first of all, is that uh, these lines are not flat. They're, they're, they vary. They're, if you want, they're, they're a bit noisy. Right. So that there's some intrinsic fluctuations in your health score. Even when you don't have the flu, uh, your health score is varying. Uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of slow, drifty kind of a way. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that everybody got the flu. Right? Well, that's not true. What, what, what the point I'm trying to make here is that in this exercise, we're only interested in the ones who got the flu. Uh, so the ones who didn't get the flu, we're not looking at their data. Right? Um, and, and that's actually a problem. I'll come back to that later. But this is the way we do uh, self-initiated movement research. Right? We only look at uh, data epochs where movements happen. Uh, we don't know what to look for otherwise. So if we do, like in a, uh, in a readiness potential experiment, we, we find these points in time where this event happened, this, the onset of the flu, and we, we extract epochs around that time and we align them to the time of flu onset, we might get something like this. Uh, and then this is, I, I actually wrote, the, you're, you're welcome to this, this is a simulation that I wrote in in MATLAB. So I didn't just Photoshop these lines. I ran this as a sort of simulation. Um, so here you see that uh, the person's health scores are kind of going down kind of gradually, and then at close to the time when the symptoms come on, they, 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 it gets a lot worse very quickly. Um, now, this is a thought experiment, so we know everything. Uh, and so what I'll show you is that contact with the virus actually happened here. Um, long after this downward trend began. So you can look at that, and, and it, at first it's puzzling. Something seems wrong about that, right? Something should seem wrong about that. Um, one possible interpretation is that your immune system knows the future. It's prescient. It knows that you're going to come in contact with the virus in a few days. And it decides, well, I might as well get the ball rolling. Yeah. Why not? I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get the flu anyway. I might as well start uh, getting sick now. Get, get a jump. You know, get a little head start. Um, we know that isn't. That doesn't make sense. There's something wrong with that. The point here is that you don't. Uh, you don't get the flu just by coming in contact with the virus. You have an immune system. You get the flu when you come in contact with the virus, and you you just happen to be in a, a, a little bit of a low. A little bit of a low state. Uh, Health-wise, uh, your immune system is just a little bit more compromised. That's when you get the flu, um, and so you tend to get the flu when your health score is already on its way down. Right? Um, that doesn't mean that uh, this downward trend in your health score reflects planning and preparation for the flu, or, or reflects an intentional process by any means. It's it's incidental. Um, doesn't mean that it doesn't play a causal role, but it's not the kind of role that we might think, that we might have thought. So this is essentially our explanation for the, for the readiness potential. It's the idea that intrinsic fluctuations in the system are caught in the flash photo of event locked out, and you recover something. What you recover, in, in fact, ends up being uh, something that looks like the autocorrelation function of the time series. Um, so do we have spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity? Yes, absolutely we do. And they, they tend to look like this upper trace, so they're, they're autocorrelated. Uh, they have a 1 over f spectrum, which is the, the, the spectrum in the upper left there. Um, they don't look like this. So if you, well, if you record EEG data, you don't get white noise like that. Check the equipment. It, it, it can have, uh, if your EEG signals look like that. So they're autocorrelated, and that, that's important. Uh, this. So, so the premise then is that uh, when the imperative to produce a movement is weak or absent, then the precise moment at which the decision threshold is crossed 
is largely determined by spontaneous subthreshold fluctuations in our life. So in a task like Libet's, the imperative to produce a movement is quite weak. Uh, you're telling the subject you can move whenever you want to, and it's sort of up to you. Right? Just wait a while and move. In theory, they could wait an hour, they could wait till tomorrow, they could never move. I mean, they're allowed. Right? Those are the instructions. But in, in actual practice, when you do these experiments, even, even though you tell them that, and even though you tell them that there are no rules, there are no limits, no one ever, ever waits longer than about 20, 25 seconds. That's simple. It's, it's tied to the demand characteristics of the task. They know they're there. This is a task about movement, and they know that I'm expecting them to move sooner or later. Right? Um, but there is an imperative. The imperative is produce a movement sometime reasonably soon. But on a time scale of uh, 5 to 10 to 15 seconds, the subject is free to choose when. There it's not, it's not uh, constrained or dictated by it. Of the demand characteristics. So we use uh, the same kind of model that's typically used in perceptual decision making studies. It's a leaky stochastic accumulator. And it produces these autocorrelated uh, time series. Um, the idea is that the same, the same machinery, uh, the same mechanism is at work in making this kind of decision as it would be in any sort of decision, which is the accumulation of evidence to a threshold. Um, except that, in this case, the noise is, is dominating. The, the, the signal for this imperative is quite weak. Um, so, to make, to make a long story short, using this model, we were able to account very well for the shape of the readiness potential uh, by fitting the uh, average trajectory of the decision variable, time lock to the threshold crossing to it, and also able to fit extremely well the behavioral distribution of waiting times in the this task, how long people wait to produce a movement, uh, with the distribution of first crossing times from the model. Uh, but the, the main point really though is all you need at a minimum are autocorrelated fluctuations in a time series and a threshold. And if you do that, you can you recover something that looks like a readiness potential and you recover a distribution of crossing times that looks like that, like, like a gamma function. Um, so our not so prevailing view now is that this early part of the readiness potential is accounted for by uh, in intrinsic spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity um, and that the actual neural decision to move happens quite late in time, maybe around 150 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds before movement. And it's interesting that that coincides not only with with uh, John Dillon's data about the point of no return, but also coincides well with uh, W time that we estimate uh, from subjects performing with its task. That tends to, to be about 150 or 200 milliseconds before movement. The time that subjects estimate, estimated that they had first felt the urge to move. Um, so maybe uh, Lib Libet's mistake was not to take his subjects at their word. Uh, when they said something happened at around 200 milliseconds, right? This is when a decision was made. Maybe they were trying to tell you something that a decision was made at around 200 milliseconds. So the movement. Uh, Libet looked at the shape of the readiness potential and, and just assumed, well, they have they have to be wrong. Uh, and and so the story went from there. But uh, maybe not. I think this is sort of a nod to, to Lamarck. I think what 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 if I'm right. Uh, the readiness potential is, is sort of a, it, it exposes a certain cognitive illusion that when you see something building up in time, just like these giraffes whose neck is getting longer and longer, you, you, it's a human tendency to attribute uh, effort and uh, uh, intentionality and purpose, right? It's as if this, this signal that's building up is, is building up for a reason, right? It's trying to get some, uh, Ours is more of a selectionist account, right, rather than a, a, a Lamarckian account of, of what this buildup looks like. Um, so where can we go from there in the last five minutes? Well, um, if you wanted uh, to do an experiment to tell apart uh, movement from no movement, or learn to predict the onset of movement, right, you would want to collect some epochs with movement and some epochs without movement and compare them. 
The problem is, is that in the field, we don't do that. Uh, I mentioned that before with the, the flu patients. Uh, we don't have these. We don't know where to look. You could sort of pick random analogs, but uh, there have been very few uh, examples of that in the literature. Typically, what we do is we extract our epochs with movement. Uh, and if we want to do some comparisons, well, we go kind of way far back in time and say, well, this will be my baseline, and then I'll compare other points in time to that. Um, but that's problematic, because that baseline is, is, is highly biased, right? Because the ep it, it has a fixed temporal resolute, but a t fixed temporal relationship with the event that you're interested in. And it's generated by the very same system that's generating that event. The problem is, is exemplified by, for example, trying to predict, trying to learn to predict the onset of rainfall based on only a sample of rainy days. Right? If you do that, and you don't look beyond your sample, you might convince yourself that you're quite a good forecaster. When in fact, all I have to do is ask my four-year-old, uh, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? And she can say, oh, it's going to be the same as today. And, it, and in fact, she'll be right a, a far more often than she'll be wrong, statistically speaking, if you consider 50-50 to be the null hypothesis. It isn't that um, So, we tried to develop an experiment. This is in collaboration with colleagues at Princeton University um, using Adaboost, using machine learning technique to try and tell these two kinds of epochs apart. We had subjects look at a slideshow. Some of the slides were advanced manually by the subject pressing a button, uh, and some of the slides advanced automatically, and the subject just waited. And the key is that the viewing time on the automatic trials was drawn from the subject's own viewing time distribution on the manual trial. So by the end of the experiment, these things were relatively well equated for how for elapsed time and anticipation and things like that. Um, so what we end up with are two sets of trials aligned to the slide transition. One terminates with just a slide transition only. The other terminates with a slide transition plus movement. So these are pretty well matched in most respects, except for the fact that in one case, there's a movement, and in the other case, there isn't. And so our, our task was then to use Adaboost to try and tell these two kinds of epochs apart at each point in time of the sliding window within which we perform the Adaboost. You can see here, these are two features that were picked out by the Adaboost uh, algorithm, meta-algorithm, in fact. Uh, the blue feature, obviously, is a, is a positive feature. It's a readiness potential feature. And the uh, green feature is a no-movement trial feature. Um, and so in white here, let me see if this will work, in white here is the sliding window, and you can see, if you, if you watch as the sliding window gets to this point, you'll notice that the ROC curve there, which is a measure of how well we're doing, uh, is still quite flat. Um, this doesn't really, so the, the ability to tell these apart doesn't match the shape of the readiness potential. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back to give you more chance to watch that. Uh, and of course, Adaboost does extremely well just at and, and after the onset of the movement. So this is what it looks like here. It doesn't look like the readiness potential. It's quite flat, and then very abruptly, the ability to tell these two apart lurches upward uh, to the near ceiling, right, to near 100%. I'm only showing you three subjects here, but these were three special subjects who came in for multiple sessions so that we had uh, about uh, 1,400 trials per subject. Uh, from those three. So this, this is the readiness potential from the same subject on top and the readiness field from MEG recording on the bottom. So you can see there's no sign of this long tail uh, in, that, uh, uh, in, in, in that, uh, AUC, uh, that AUC estimate of the classifier performance, sorry. Um, so you might say, oh, well, maybe your classifier just isn't sensitive to what's happening uh, beforehand. What's, your classifier isn't sensitive to what, what's happening in the earlier time periods. Uh, maybe it's just a null result. Well, if we do this the quote-unquote old-fashioned way, um, we use uh, only the movement epochs and compare to a remote baseline, uh, we get these red traces here. So we get a grossly inflated impression of our ability to predict. Suddenly, when we do this, uh, when we take advantage of the autocorrelation in the data, use a remote baseline, and compare each position of our sliding window to it. Um, so this, this highlights a point 
a very important point that using event locked epochs in studying self initiated movement is highly problematic. Now, there's a paper by Marco Rusconi uh, just on, on this topic. So I'll wrap up. Um, I'll just mention here that uh, you can do the same thing. You can predict threshold crossings uh, in a random time series. This is this is a we use here. I used a, 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 a Gaussian naive Bayes uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm to to uh, try and predict threshold crossings in a random autocorrelated time series. And of course, you can. You can do so quite well, even though this is perfectly random. It's because the null hypothesis here is not 50-50. This is the null hypothesis. This is, a, it, this is what in weather forecasting is called a persistence model. It's the model that you have to be. Um, so future directions, just to wrap up, um, we're, we're looking at this as, as if you were looking at a weather forecasting problem. So in, rather, than, rather than looking at uh, the probability of a signal, at times t plus tau in the past, given a movement at time zero, which is what the readiness potential gives us. We're now looking at the probability of a movement at times t plus tau in the future, given the state of the system now. Um, and building these distributions takes a lot of data. This is an idealized one from, from sim simulated data, but this is what, it, what this looks like. And it doesn't lie. So it, it will not give you an uh, uh, inflated Impression of your ability to predict. Uh, and based on our preliminary work with these, we see our ability to predict goes out about 200 milliseconds into the